be a YouTube video. Okay, so welcome once again to our session today, our taste session on supporting children's learning at home for children with special educational needs disability. And I'm going to hand over to Anita now to take us through the session. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I'm putting my camera on for now just so you can see me. Uh, I put my best shirt on for you. Um, so uh, hopefully you're uh, all feeling comfortable at home. And yeah, do just let us know in the chat if you're having any problems and we have a team of people there to help. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to have a number of different ways, as Olivia said, for you to interact with us today in this session. To start with, it's going to be through the chat and we'll also invite you to write on the slides for various um, times. If you need to, if you have a question or a problem that you need to, to uh, help with, write it in the chat or raise your hand, but best to write in the chat at the moment. Um, uh, later on, we're hoping to have some time for you to actually have a chat um, because you've got, all got your, your mics um, today. So that's great. So my name is Anita Collins. I'm the program manager. So welcome to this session. I'm the program manager for the learning and teaching programs at the Lifelong Learning Centre at the University of Leeds. Um, so I'm going to be kind of talking. We're going to be doing a little bit of a taster for the next half hour or so. Um, where you're going to be looking at a number of different things and we're going to be working in the kind of interactive way that we work. You know, we don't have lectures as such on these programmes and so we've got a kind of online version of what, what we normally do today for you. So welcome, I hope you enjoy it. So as Olivia has already introduced the session, so we're looking at supporting learning at home. So I'm focusing very much today on, um, you know, informal uh, uh, learning like homework, you know, obviously at the moment with lockdown, we've got lots of things going on at home, um, you know, an additional kind of maybe homeschooling as well. So thinking about the um, learning, particularly in that kind of context, and thinking about young people and children with uh, special educational needs and disabilities. Um, throughout, I, I got, I kind of, it was starting to get a bit laborious to write children, child and young person. So there will be points where it just says child, but please read young person as well for that. You know, we're looking across the whole age range of sort of compulsory schooling, basically. Um, so we run, uh, so yeah, so we're thinking about um, informal learning outside a formal school environment. Um, and this is a key at any time. And obviously at the moment it's it's critical. We're all very conscious of this. Um, and obviously children with SEND have been able to access, should have been able to access schooling for all through this period, but actually quite a lot of them have not been able to because of that disability. There might've been shielding and there might've been lots of issues. Um, so, you know, in practice, we know a lot of children are at home. You know, a lot of young people are at home who have special education and disability. So we thought this would be a useful thing to do. Um, some of you who are here today who are uh, already signed up to come uh, on, this, on this course um, in September, this will give you a bit of a sort of taster of what uh, some of the themes that we're going to be looking at over the next few years on the programme. Okay, so we're thinking about that from a number of perspectives. So first of all, we thought, um, what is SEND? What is Special Educational Needs and Disability? I, I put SEND on the, the programme, but we're going to include disabilities as well. And this is quite a straightforward definition. And, you know, one of the things we do do in the, in the, uh, in the programme is we, um, we look at um, disability from a, a policy perspective as well as a practical perspective um and that's one of the things that we're looking at today so we're starting um to do this um so if we can um look at this so yeah learn difficulty or disability so we look at codes of practice we look at policy um somebody's got a special educational need they've got significantly greater difficulty in learning than the majority of others of the same age that is the kind of policy definition of special educational needs so it's something about you know a relationship to peers if a child seems to be behind it in some way or struggling with some aspect of learning that uh, others of the same age group in the same stage are not so there's a kind of developmental aspect of that identifying special educational needs as compared to what might be uh, typical of that age group or stage. If we're talking about disability, there's a, um, you know, disability is where we've got um, facilities, difficulties with making use of facilities of the kind generally provided for others at the same age in mainstream schools. Now, it's interesting that, that is, this is a definition because we will look a little bit later at um, 
um, adjustments and accessibility and obviously that is a key thing that we need to think about at, at home and obviously in a school environment as well so it's kind of interesting and a little bit ironic that this is part of the definition of disability disability to the, the most recent send code of practice so you know if it if it creates a barrier to learning then that would be part of the definition of a disability um, so we need to think about how to enable that environment. So I think it's useful to think about what this is at the moment um, as a starting point. And another way that we can think about special educational needs and disability is from a neurodiversity approach. So this is a relatively new concept. It's been kind of come up, come up been, uh, been thought about much more within uh, disability rights movements and also within academia. For the last sort of 20 years or so and thinking about diversity not just about diversity in a way that we think about it like racial or, or gender that kind of diversity but we're thinking about neurological diversity and I think this is a really useful um, slide here because this looks at the kind of links between and the and the relationship between and also the range of differences and um, we're seeing these as differences rather than as as weaknesses or difficulties so we're thinking about you know when we're looking at this later on we're thinking about strengths as well as areas that can cause challenges so you know something like ADHD uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder there's lots of strengths within that as well as areas that can be challenging within a sort of traditional educational environment and we can see on there there are also lots of positives on there so creativity hyper focus energy and passion in adhd so we've got lots of strengths on here and you can also see how there's some interrelationships between some of these differences so we're going to think about differences but we're going to think about it very much from a positive standpoint so that i think those are just a couple of perspectives that are really useful when we're starting out with this so what we're going to do for the first part of this uh, session is we're going to think about these three areas on the slide that I've got here. So we're going to think about three key principles for practice in relation to SEND. And this would apply in a school, but we're thinking about it very much from a home environment. As I said at the beginning, that's the context we're working with. So think about starting from the child or young person as a unique individual. So those last two, in particular the last slide, thinking about their strengths as well as areas which might present difficulties for learning so really starting from the individual differentiation is really important across education but i think it's absolutely essential um, when we're talking about special education and needs and disabilities about send practice so we're going to start thinking about the individual then we're going to think about the learning environment how can we make it positive how can we make it accessible how can we provide appropriate adjustments so again we we'll think we think about positive learning environments for all children for all young people that's really important to get them ready to learn to make them feel happy within uh, and settled within that learning environment but it's absolutely crucial because actually uh, the wrong kind of environment can create a barrier to learning for for children with send so it means they just can't access the learning so it's absolutely critical again the third part that we're going to look at is thinking about the needs of the learners so obviously that really relates to points one and two um, but we're going to think about what might the content of learning be for learners who have special educational needs and disabilities might that be different might there be a different focus or emphasis than for children who are following a mainstream curriculum how might we want to adjust that might we want to look at something very different it may be that something like communication or social interaction is a real priority for those children and young people maybe behavior or life skills are a real priority so again we'll have a look at that and think about you know what is it that we're going to be teaching them and you know maybe we need to rethink that we're not just following the national curriculum we're thinking about that unique individual we're thinking about you know what is the priority for them so those are the first three things we're going to have a look at. So we'll start off um, by thinking about the individual, that first point, who. So I've really couched this in a series of questions. Um, who is the child or the young person? Or if you have a number of children or young people you're working with um, or that you have at home, then who are those children? What are their, is their individual profile of strengths? What are their areas of development or need? So you might need to think about some diagnostics um, you know there might be a diagnosis of a particular area of need like autism ASC is autistic spectrum condition it's just another term for that or you might have an education health and care plan but this shouldn't define the individual approach to them so you know we need to think about things more broadly just not in relation to sort of a diagnosis or some kind of formal top-down we need to think about you know, that child and experience of that child so 
I think, you know, there's a number of ways that we can identify, you know, that profile of that child and the strengths and the needs. Like I said uh, just now, a formal diagnosis, they might have that from a doctor, from an educational or a clinical psychologist. So you may have a child with, with that kind of diagnosis. They may well then also have or uh, separate from that have an education health and care plan which is the most uh, recent document that is generated for individuals who have a recognized need um, so those are the two sort of top down um, ways that you might uh, have some idea about the sort of needs those tend to focus quite a lot on the needs of the of the young person or the child but also I think you know it's important to think about the strengths you do get that on education health and care plans as well that focus on strengths <coughs> Other ways that you can do this is are more bottom up and are more experiential. So observation, experience, you know, time spent with that child or young person, watching them, looking at their, you know, what they do, thinking about what, what are their strengths and their needs, you know, just getting to know them. That's a really, really key thing. And it goes back to that first point, which is saying we want to get to know that individual, you know, who, who are they? That is the, that is the starting point. Thinking about others, school, maybe if you're liaising with school givers, professionals, you know, they may be able to give you information about the strengths and needs. Thinking about discussing or communicating whatever way is appropriate with that child or young person. And it could be through observation that you need to communicate because um, it could be behaviour as a way of communicating needs as well as, as strengths. So, you know, it's really important to, to involve the young person identifying that. So what I'm going to invite you to do now is the first of a series of slides and I'm going to invite you to contribute your thoughts about this and you can talk about this quite, you can write something quite general or you can write something very specific about an individual or a group of individuals that you're thinking about. I'll invite you to click on this text uh, icon at the top here and if you do this and then you can write on the slide like I have done so there. So I'm going to give you two minutes now just to write something on here as you wish. You don't have to, but if you wish to contribute something, thinking about, you know, who, who might you be working with? What's their individual profile of strengths or areas for developmental needs? Maybe write about how you could identify this or how you have identified it. So any thoughts that you've got on those things that we've just been looking at, please feel free to write. <laughs> We won't know who you are, don't worry as well, it doesn't attach it to your name, so you can write anything. Thank you very much, <laughs> somebody's jumped in there. And just to say if anyone can't access the whiteboard, um, you can also type in the chat if you've got anything you'd like to add to this. Um, but the way to do that, as Anita has said, if you do want to access the whiteboard is to click on the big T at the top of the screen and then click anywhere on the slide. Some of you have found that already, that's brilliant and you can start typing, thank you. Thank you very much okay oops okay one thing it's important not to do there's a, a there's a clear button here so um that's it lovely so just make sure you're clicking on this text button because if you're clear you're going to clear for everybody that was me sorry oh, <laughs> no. oh. <laughs> i'm so sorry could the people who wrote those brilliant comments please write them again <laughs> apologies there's always everyone one, Olivia. there's always one <laughs> <laughs> fantastic thank you very much <laughs> That's a really interesting one. Consideration with being with others. Lovely. That's really nice. We've got some things here. Good. Lovely. So we've got some people, we've got some, some lovely examples of uh, diagnoses, maybe particular areas of need. Atixia, right? We'll get some, we'll ask if uh, the person who's written Atixia, could you just write there what, can you add to that an explanation? Quiet space, lovely, yeah. So need for a quiet space, that's lovely. Yeah, don't worry, we'll move your stuff around if it's uh, getting a bit, sometimes it goes a bit off, off the page. Lovely, so we've had about a minute now, fantastic, brilliant. So you're thinking about particular areas, lovely. And then can I just ask you to add, I know we've not got much space because it's quite a lot of you, any ways that you can identify this or you have been identifying these particular uh, areas of needs or strengths?
lovely. So can can you just any assessments, lovely? So somebody's put assessments down. So any other way that you have been able to or wanted to? Lovely. So I can see from this that you've got some very specific children and young people that you're looking at. Good. We've got observations. Oral assessment, observation, counselling. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Great. Primary school observation, observing, annual review. Okay, lovely. So some of these things are more formal, like an annual review, spending time with them. Lovely, yeah. And some of them are more about, like I said, that kind of formative, ongoing assessment. That's absolutely brilliant. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. So this will be captured by the recording. So uh, it's okay if we if we move on now because it, it will erase it. But thank you very much for all of those really good uh, contributions. Absolutely lovely. OK, good. So I think, you know, what we're thinking about is obviously you've got some particular individuals in mind and we're thinking about some of the specific ways in which, you know, you might be finding out about the needs and the strengths of those individuals. So next thing is to think about the environment. So we've got some nice picture images there of different environments where uh, you know, a children people might be engaged in things. Now, obviously, we're thinking about a home environment. So thinking about what's an appropriate and accessible environment to meet the child or young person's needs. Are there any adjustments required? This is something that is part of recent policy. Reasonable adjustments since 2000 have been really key. The idea of reasonable adjustments has been really key for formal uh, education and other environments. But obviously we need to have adjustments at home in a home environment. So we need to think about the physical environment. We need to think about resources and equipment and also the emotional, social and emotional environment as well. <laughs> so any part of the home could be used as a learning environment. And I think, you know, we need to think about, we'll think about today, you know, what adjustments might you need to make to these spaces? So somebody put on the earlier slide, in the, in the slide you've just filled in, a quiet space was one of the, the needs of that child or young person. You might need a sensory space for, for regulation if that child's got um, autism or something similar. They might need cushions or crash mats, gates or barriers for physical safety. They might need particular equipment, again, with autism, headphones or a booth. Um, to kind of block out overstimulation. There might be physical need for things like grippers, audio or visual or laptops for children who might have dyslexic type issues or, or sensory difficulties. So there's lots of different things that we might need to think about in the physical environment. Obviously, we need to be kind of low tech most of the time in a, in a home environment. There's also uh, equipment that you can buy. We also need to think about the social and emotional environment. So thinking about the physical layout, how accessible it is to the, the child or young person, we need to think about the social and emotional environment as well. And that's the same for all children and young people. Thinking about positive relationships, building positive relationships and trust is absolutely key for SEND. It's important for all positive learning relationships. Encouragement, patience, I'm sure we all know about this. Anyone who's been working with children and young people, Thinking about creating security through boundaries that are clearly and consistently sort of managed and clear and consistent expectations, use of routines and rituals as appropriate to the particular individual, thinking about transitions into and out of activities, thinking about positively reinforcing behaviour and positively enforcing uh, learning rather than using sanctions, so using that as a way to, to kind of uh, enable um, and create safety. And thinking about a balance of interaction, including support for social development. So, you know, those are just a few kind of things, really, and they're all huge areas in themselves. You know, I'm just throwing them out today, aren't I, as though it's easy. But, you know, these are these are big areas. But um, again, key for key areas to think about in relation to SEN. So thinking about an accessible environment, I'm just going to give you one minute because I, I, we're a little bit short of time. So just one minute to put anything on there that strikes you from those few slides that I've gone through, those few areas. Thinking about the physical environment, thinking about the social and emotional environment, any adjustments that you might require. Again, thinking maybe about that particular young person or child or children that you might be involved with or are involved with. So any thoughts? Lovely. Thank you. 
And obviously, if you're thinking about a home environment, something like wheelchair access can be a big thing. You know, you're not somewhere that's necessarily got the resources to do that. Lovely. Thank you. Security. Yeah. So thinking about safety, when I was thinking about when I was planning this session, I was thinking about all of the, the safety I had to do when I had toddlers in my home, you know, babies and toddlers. You know, there's actually quite a lot of kit that, uh, that you, might you might need to have. But, you know, fairly, fairly uh, um, cheap to get hold of. Thank you. Yes. A quiet place or a sensory room. Lovely. Stranger Jane, just lovely. So things about safety. British Sign Language Visual Aids, that's lovely, that's something very specific obviously for uh, a child who has uh, a hearing impairment or a young person. Good, calm environment, that's lovely, yeah, use of routine, great stuff, yeah. Thank you, yeah, that's a really good idea, removing furniture that could be a risk, so you can just take it out of the way, absolutely. So it's like you might need to do an audit of that environment if you hadn't been uh, you know, in that environment, uh, if that child or young person is new to that environment, if it's not the, the usual home environment. Lovely security, yeah. Because some of you might be having children into your home environment who, you know, are not your own children, they make the children that you have care of. No quick change, lovely, yeah. So that's to do with the transitions, um, being really kind of clear about if things are, what's coming up, yeah, absolutely, great. Routine, good. Fantastic. Thank you very much for all of those. So again, we've got that there. So I think social stories. Yeah. So social stories is where you're helping to develop social and, and uh, social understanding through a story, literally a story that, that shows how that works. Considering guests, a very interesting one. OK, yeah. So bringing guests into the environment, that's a really good idea. OK, so yes, we, we're all a bit lockdown focused at the moment, aren't we? But of course you can have guests and you can also go out to other other parts of the um, environment. It doesn't have to just be at home. But I guess the whole the same issues around security um, would be there. Uh, yes. Uh, if Nadia, Nadia, are you raising your hand? Do you want to just pop something in the chat if you've got a question? <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> it's lovely to see you. That's great. I'm going to move on. That's, those are lots of really good ideas. Being prepared for change. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. So again, really, I'm just raising some questions with you today. Um, the next thing we're going to think about is what? We're going to think about what might be the curriculum, what might be the learning content, or what might be the focus of uh, uh, learning at home with children with SEND, special education needs and disability. And I put a question here, you know, how much ownership does, does the child have over deciding these? Because obviously with a home, in a home environment, maybe we have got more flexibility of an, uh, enabling a, a, a curriculum to be really child focused or young person focused, starting from where they are. Um, so these are just, again, a few suggestions for how we might do this. At early stages, like foundation stage, sort of early years, play and exploration would be very, very key. It's a key part of learning. And that lends itself very well to children with special educational needs and disabilities. Creativity, again, is an, an area where, you know, all children can, can be uh, encouraged to engage. This can be a really positive way to enable risk, risk taking and to, to support independence with children who may be not encouraged to do that very much or become quite risk averse. So creativity can be a really great pathway into that. Lots of practical experiences and equipment, experiential learning that would be, you know, as they're getting older, it becomes more focused on experiential learning. Obviously, starting from the child or young person's interests. And if you've got a child with autism, they might have very specific and very keen interests. Um, and like early, you know, thinking about maybe communication, social, emotional and behaviour, as well as life skills. So rather than just thinking about, you know, your subject areas, your kind of uh, national curriculum subject areas. So these are some of the things that we may be focusing on. So, again, thinking about your particular young person or child or children that you might be working with with SEND, you know, what might be the priority areas for them in terms of need? What might be the things that they are? interested in it could be coming from their own interests what could be the kind of areas that they might need most so it might be they need life skills like cooking or gardening you know might be very positive things to do and again things that you can do within the home environment so again just a minute to pop up any ideas here just to say for people who've been joining later and having connection problems the way to write on the slide is to click on the t at the top of the screen and then click Thank anywhere you. on the slide and then you can type or you. you can type things in the chat brilliant thank you very much lovely 
So understanding and sharing emotions, that's a really lovely uh, suggestion there. Thank you, you've added that. Understanding specific interests, lovely. Taking responsibility, yes, that can be a really important part, lovely. Thank you, all of these are great suggestions. Role play, that's a really lovely way to include some creativity and it kind of links to the social stories uh, suggestion uh, earlier somebody was saying you know it's about looking at how how do these things how do social situations play out in in practice yeah that's a really good how to be with others lovely mindfulness yes that's a great suggestion there accepting their identity and needs that's lovely yeah so work on the self yeah absolutely when we're saying start from that individual you know if, if we're planning the curriculum around them then that could be a real, you know, they can be uh, an understanding of themselves can be a really key part of that. Great, loads of great ideas there. Really good suggestions. Thank you. So linking to how to be with others, social skills, taking responsibility, independence, life, basic life skills. Lovely. Good encouragement. Yeah. Risk taking. Yeah. Like climbing frame. Yeah. That's lovely. So again, these might be things that you've got in your home environment and that can be safely used. That's brilliant. Thank you. Good. OK, I'm just going to uh, we've got a few more minutes for this this bit of the session. So we're just going to go on to the last part when I'm going to think about how. So what are some of the key elements of Send practice? I know I've given you an awful lot. I've really distilled a lot of today's session. So, you know, do take some time to have a think about it afterwards. And I'm going to give you some time in a minute to, to think about it together as well. So thinking about the actual how, how do you support this, you know, the who, the what, the where? Um, through kind of methodology, through practice with children who have a SEN or SEND. So thinking about a few, few key areas like concentration, you know, thinking about matching the length of the task to the child's ability to attend or, or concentrate, and that's just about paying attention often, isn't it, to that child or young person to see where they're struggling or when you need to move to a different type of activity or when it's a good idea not even to try with that activity, okay, it's not going to work today. Link to that if the child is tired, thinking about rest breaks, downtime, you know, different kinds of, of activities. Making sure there's a clear focus. This would be particularly key for some types, some children and young people that you have a very clear focus without distractions, one task at a time. You might have an in tray, an out tray, or a clear table or a mat. Need for variety really links to the kind of rest breaks and downtime as well, you know, varied between focus tasks and play or movement activities and again moving around spaces or between spaces to enable this. Multisensory, and this is a really important point for all children and young people, you know, multisensory learning is beneficial to all, but it could be really key for some kind of some learners with some particular needs. So, for example, obviously a child with a hearing difficulty or a child with autism might find pictorial stimuluses and visuals really, really beneficial. Um, and so, you know, but also you might need pet taste or touch as well um, to reinforce um, learning and to reinforce the experience. And be flexible, be prepared to change plans and adapt to the child. That's a really, really important point. So we've got a picture there actually of a of a learning uh, a learning support assistant supporting a child with writing and you can see that with the way that that's, that's happening in a very kind of physical way these really relate more to the uh, communication aspect of what you might do with that child or young person so thinking about your communication to be clear not ambiguous you know without the uh, uh, double meanings thinking about Make keeping your language simple in terms of appropriate level for that particular child. One question at a time, as well, giving time to prepare an answer. So that might be, you know, making sure you have plenty of, of uh, thinking time, pause, you know, uh, between questions or a bit of time for the child to go away and think about it and come back with a response. Using visual timetables or object of reference, I've got a slide on that in a minute. So that can be really important in terms of helping children to move from one um, phase to another. Repetition, obviously, really key because a lot of children with SEN have difficulty with short term memory and moving from short term to long term memory. So you need lots of repetition with development or extension to revisit and consolidate learning. Again, that's good practice with everybody, but key with SEN. 
Scaffolding is a term we use a lot in learning and teaching, and it's thinking about how do you model something, how do you show a child or young person something, and then break down the task and then help them to, to build it up. And How do you support them in that process? It's literally like putting a structure around them, and then you graduate that away as they're able to do more and more independently. And then making links as well. This is something, again, children with ascent often find quite difficult to make links between different areas and to different subjects and also to generalise and to apply to different contexts. So concept maps can be a really good way of doing that or just talking about that as part of your, your, just your chat as you're, you're uh, working with children or young people on a particular task. So this is an example of a pictorial, um, a visual timetable that one of our students has have got, has used. And this is what's called an object of reference. So for a, a child who has trouble, trouble with communication, this would be an object of reference for, say, a bath or water play or something like that. OK, so uh, positive ways to work with the child or young person. So maybe would you like to share maybe the favourite one that you had from the, the list that I've done or one that's favourite for you maybe that wasn't in that list of things that I've gone through. So what are things that you've, what are, could you share any ways that you found a particularly positive or effective working with children or young people and uh, yeah okay lovely. Talking Matt lovely yeah. Great. Sharing interests, lovely. So that links to both the content, doesn't it, and the process. We're doing a scaffolding. The talking mat, yeah, a mat in which you can go through things, lovely. People have used visual timetables. Chunking the work, good, that's a lovely word. Thank you for that. Chunking, so it's breaking it down into, into chunks and then maybe having a change or a, a move between them. Pupil-led, lovely, yes. So I think being as pupil-led as you can be, particularly if you're working one-to-one -one or in with small number of, of children or young people, you've got the opportunity to do that. Sentence starters, lovely. That's a very effective way to get uh, children and young people started on writing. Um, lovely. Demonstration is really key. Good. Yeah. Good. Pecs, yeah. Using pictures um, as a ex picture exchange. Um, so that is to help with children who have communication difficulties so that they can give you a picture or you can show them a picture and that's a way of communicating. Brilliant. Using a timer for set tasks. Lovely. That's a really good suggestion. Constantly assess understanding covertly. Yeah, good. Yeah. So assessment doesn't need to be in your face. I haven't particularly focused on assessment today, but that's a really good one. So you can see, can't you, observation and just kind of like little nudges is often a really effective way of doing that. Lovely, showing you care, lovely, yes. So showing an interest and showing engagement with that. Brilliant, and role play, lovely. Somebody's good at role play, you can come and show us. <laughs> That's fantastic, thank you very much. Okay, so this next bit, we're gonna have about five minutes to do this now. We're gonna, um, we're going to um, have a go at, oh, humor somebody's put, that's lovely. <laughs> humor is important. What I'd like you to do is I'm going to give you five minutes just to we're going to put you into groups and for you to have an actual physical chat so you can unmute your mics at this point. I'd like you to think about which points that we've talked about all the way through that you can apply easily. And I don't unmute your mic quite yet. <laughs> um, which points can you apply easily? And are there any points that we've looked at that might be particularly problematic or impossible for you in your particular situation? So it's just for you to have a general chat for about five minutes through the, the, the uh, areas that we've been looking at. And I'm going to put you into uh, breakout groups now. So what you'll find is it's a bit like Harry Potter going up the chimney. You will suddenly be zoomed into a group with some other people. Um, yeah that's brilliant so you can put your mics on when you get into that room so i'm going to put you in breakout groups now i'll share this slide with you in those breakout groups and it's just to give you five minutes to have a chat about this um and uh, so you can actually speak to other people here okay
Lovely. Well, welcome back, um, everybody. I'm just going to share my video so you can see me again. Um, I popped into a couple of rooms. Sorry, I got a little bit flustered when we put you all into rooms and ended up trying to do it all through the chat, so which was why I was getting myself in a bit of a tangle. Anyway, well done. You all got in there, despite my best efforts. And you've obviously all had a really nice uh, chat in there and we've come up with some ideas. So um, would you just like to maybe one person from each of the group, um, any anyone from the group, if you just like to pop your mic on and just share maybe a couple of points um, that you thought maybe you could apply easily and anything that was problematic. So maybe you can you can put your mic on and just tell us uh, from the group if you wish to do so. Just one person from each group. Sorry, I should have told you that beforehand. That you're going to report back. Karen, you've got your mic on. Does that mean you're volunteering to talk? Oh, <laughs> she's no. Going to... no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone from group one want to tell tell me anything? Vincent? No. <laughs> we might have to move on if we can't have any uh um I, I, I learned something which was the Osmo. I don't know who it was that talked about that, but if you wouldn't mind sharing that it was really interesting. I can't I can't remember who that was in group one. Oh, uh, it was about the Osmo. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you mm -hmm. very much, Katarina. Would you mind explaining that? Thank you. Yeah, Osmo is um, a learning device when you're using camera, uh, putting on iPad or tablet, and it's uh, taking, you know, it's uh, interactive. It's helping children who have uh, visual and hearing impairment. Yeah. It could be used for children who are without any special education. Needs. It's helping with uh, math uh, in the form of playing. Mm. It's doing coding as well, uh, helping with fine motor skill because of the drawing. So it's a uh, possible when, when you add uh, when you put the Osmo, just Osmo in the Google, then it's coming and it's possible to, uh, you know, when school want to apply, they can apply for funding from the Osmo and so they can send it uh, to school. Okay, lovely. Fantastic, Katrina. Thank you so much. Yeah, we've all learned about that. That sounds really, really good. Um, and obviously, technology is a really key area, isn't it, that can enable we and we could have a whole other course on that, actually. So thank you very much. Lovely. Anyone from group two would like to say anything about any points that you raised in your discussion? Oh, thank you, Olivia. Olivia has put something on Play Osmo. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Olivia, for that. I hope somebody will be brave from group two because there was really interesting discussion about oh. how difficult it is as a balancing act as parents yeah. trying to cope with the, the homeschooling, particularly undifferentiated learning. Kateri, uh, Karen, sorry, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, as, as I already said, I work in a high school anyway, so um, trying to get the balance with my own daughter uh, getting her out of bed, getting her motivated to actually do some work. It, it's just been really difficult and frustrating because um, she, she's at the age where she's to be choosing her options and stuff like that. And there's some of the work as well that she's been sent home. That I'm like, I've got no idea what that's going on about. Mm. You know, but it is quite difficult, even though I work, work in high school and I'm supporting high school students. It's still not easy when when you are in an education background as a as a as a job. Mm. So, and I also said as well that you know obviously they've got a routine at school. They've got to do a narrow block of whatever mm. subject. Um, but if you just say right, just do half an hour of that, and then do half an hour of that, and then um, we'll do some baking, or we'll go for a walk, or we'll do whatever. You know, try and keep um, as much of a routine as possible mm -hmm. while we're at home. Lovely. That sounds great, Karen. And what you're what you're also describing is both a routine and variety, isn't it? So you're creating a different sort of focus through through different activities. Yeah. yeah. Great. Lovely. I would love to. Yeah, I'd love to kind of keep keep going with this discussion, but we're going to have to move on. So, but anyway, that's given you a bit of a flavour on how we uh, kind of 
actually conduct her activities and and that is the way that you would be learning on the course you know lots of discussion bits of input lots of discussion and you know there'll be more linking into maybe more academic and policy things as well but but that does really give you a flavor so i'm going to move on now to i'm going to hand over to the learning champions and olivia to to introduce them thank you very much everybody for all your fantastic contributions in that little session thanks yeah and thank you anita that was really interesting i think we all took plenty from that for our, our own parenting if not our own practice in schools um and as i said at the beginning we're very lucky today to have uh, one of the students from the learning and teaching SCND foundation degree who's come up along and joined us taken time out of your own family and work responsibilities so sabahi would you like to unmute and just tell us a little bit about your experience please Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sabahi and I'm on my um, last year uh, foundation degree. Um, I feel like uh, it was just a few days, a few months ago since I started my undergraduate course. And um, back then it didn't feel like it was going to be possible. But uh, when I was in college, I met Olivia. Um, uh, who came in to uh, talk about um, university course. And uh, before that, I didn't know that I could join university being a mature student uh, and uh, not gone through a traditional route, uh, completing um, sixth form. So I had uh, quite a few bits to put in, like learning gaps. So I decided to complete uh, English GCSE and math. And then after that, I sought a career um, advice from University of Leeds. Then I was able to apply for the for this course and uh, it didn't finish there to be honest it, i had to put quite a lot of work into you know managing my time being a part-time student uh, working and family um, with three young children so it hasn't been that easy but it's doable to be honest if i can do it you can do it too and there's quite a lot of other support uh, in a lifelong long learning center. And there was a time when I decided to apply for a job where I was volunteering. And um, to be honest, I didn't know where to start with the interview, filling, you know, application forms. So from LLC, lifelong learning center, I was helped and they helped to prepare me for the job interview. And uh, there were 100 applicants as far as I remember. And I was chosen for the interview. The 10 of us on the interview day, I remember clearly because it was a long interview. We had to, to take part in the class and then there was, you know, to write in, <laughs> all sorts all sorts it was a very long long interview to be honest but yeah i did get the job and uh, so not only academic support there are other areas that you if you need help and if possible they do you know help you so go on and uh, if you feel like you need to do it, do it. If I can do it, I'm saying it again, you can do it too. And uh, personally, I'm not very, com I, I've never been a very confident person, but now I can speak um, like the way I'm speaking now. It, people listening to me get really nervous and I lose my words, but. I feel I feel a bit more confident now. You know, talking in public. 
telling you about my my journey, how much I feel proud of myself from what I've achieved, where back then I didn't feel that I could do it, to be honest. Yeah, that's it. Fantastic, Sabahi. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with it with us today. It's really good. I think I I hope it's useful for everyone joining us this afternoon to hear that it is possible to be a parent of three children and now working as well and studying part time alongside that. So I and it sounds like um, your experience and what you've learned on the course helped you into paid work as well in school. So lot, that's not a little bit work in a lot of different areas to be honest. Even being you know like confident talking. If you can remember how I was, I used to run away, you know, hide behind my peers back. You know, so by his turn to speak, and I would just you know hide. But. Yeah, but you have so much to offer. It's great to hear that you've been able to put all your experience into practice as a parent and now uh, everything you've learnt on the course as well. I'm sure you, you're um, bringing something very positive to the children that you're working with. So I'm, I'm, it's great you've had that opportunity and thank you very much for giving up a bit of your time today to join us because I know you, it, things are very busy for you. And Sabahi, I think you're able to stay with us to, for the next 15 minutes or so till the end of the session. So if people do have questions yes, um, for Sabahi, once you've heard about the course or Anita or Nadine, please do ask them in the chat or by raising your hand. Um, so thank you again, Sabahi. Just to say before I hand back to Anita to tell us a little bit more about about the program itself. The elephant in the room is always money, isn't it? And many adults will be thinking, well, this is all very well. I'd love to study in university, maybe part time, but I have to feed my family. I need to work. How is it going to work for me? I can't afford the fees. So the, we are offering a student finance session on the 16th of July with more information on this, another free online session, but just some headlines. You don't need cash up front to pay fees for university. You get a, go a loan from the government, um, which most people are eligible for as long as they don't already have a UK degree and you're, you meet certain residency requirements in the UK and have leave to remain. You can get that loan to pay your fees, but also for your living costs so some of our students who might have been on uh, lower incomes either on benefits or um, uh, part-time low paid work in the past will often say that they're actually financially better off once they get to, um, living cost loans from the government and also some non-repayable financial support from the university itself so each institution will have its own finance package we can advise you to to look at the different ones and find out which is going to work best for you you may also also be entitled to additional financial support if you um, have a disability or if you're supporting uh, dependents or you're a carer if you have children um, and so that's worth looking into and again we can help you figure out exactly what you might be entitled to to make the decision and after 30 years all remaining debt is wiped so if you never earn above I think the threshold is nearly 27,000 now if you never earn that you don't repay it um, if you do earn it you repay about 30 pounds a month if you're earning about 27,000 pounds a year so it's a very affordable rate and you're that the debt, as it's known, um, is really more of a graduate tax because it just the way it works, if you earn a little bit more, you pay some back. It's not passed on to your family or anything like that. So seeing it as a debt is not that helpful, really. We always describe it as a graduate tax. So now I'll hand back to Anita to tell us a little bit more about the Learning and Teaching and SEND Foundation degrees. Hi, thank you, Olivia. <laughs> OK, thanks very much. And thank you again to Sabai. That was absolutely fantastic. We have lots of amazing students, obviously, on the course and who've been on the course who come and talk about their experiences. So thank you for also agreeing to stay um, to chat later. OK, so the Foundation Degree in Learning and Teaching, there's two pathways, basically. Some of you may be interested in the SEND pathway as well. So we have two pathways the generic pathway, learning and teaching, and the learning and teaching SEND pathway. So I'm just going to go through like the key parts of it, really, for the next 10 minutes or so. It's designed, it's an applied degree, so it's designed very much for people supporting learning, working with learners in different educational settings. We do ask you to be doing a minimum of 60 hours a year in some kind of educational setting or with children and young people. 
Um, it's rooted in professional practice. So like I said, it's very much about practice like we've done today in our taster. Um, there is the SEND uh, special education needs and disability route, which doesn't have very many differences from the generic route in terms of what you do. But obviously it means you have SEND on your certificate. <clears throat> Just a few practicalities on the foundation degree, you'll study one afternoon a week, four hours, one till five o'clock. In the first year, it's on Tuesdays. On the second, in the second and third year, it's on Wednesdays. And you have automatic right to progress onto the BA um, top up, which is on Thursday. OK, you don't have to reapply for the BA. So you're on the foundation degree for three years part time and then the BA 18 months to two years part time. And those are the days. There are, you attend in two semesters, 10 weeks per semester. So you get all your usual holidays off. If you've got children, you'll be able to be on holiday with them. We uh, also have reading weeks for half terms, um, which follow the um, Leeds reading weeks. Um, and that's to give you time off if you're obviously going to be with your children, if you've got children, um, or also if you're working with schools that you can take the time off for holidays. The foundation degree is three years part time, like I said, automatic right to progress to the BA top up. The link at the bottom is the link to the foundation degree on our uh, programme catalogue. So you can have a look at some more details there. But I'm just going to outline the key areas. First of all, entry requirements. So you need to have Master English GCSE grade C or uh, four or above or equivalent. OK, so it could be in some cases like a functional skills Master English. You, will, you, you also need a level three diploma in a relevant subject area, like a cash or three A-level a passes. And like I said, you need to be engaged in some sort of relevant work experience, but it doesn't have to be paid, it can be voluntary. Um, we have, um, for the GCSE and the level three diploma, we also have our own entry scheme. So if you don't have these qualifications, but you're interested in applying, just have a chat with me or the outreach team and we can advise you um, because we have alternative and an alternative entry scheme that you can apply to. In terms of the course, in the first year, they are all uh, core modules. So we have four modules that are outlined there. Um, all of our modules really have some, most of our modules have uh, quite a strong SEND element. Obviously, this one, inclusion and SEND, and typical and atypical child development has got a strong SEND, um, uh, a strong SEND, SEND flavour. Um, so this is generic and the uh, SEND pathway all do these modules in the first year. We also have academic and professional skills, which is really to help get your study skills up to scratch. Second year, the core modules are a teaching practice uh, module, uh, a little bit on education perspectives. If you are on the SEND route, you do a work based learning placement in your second semester of your second year. In year three, these are your core modules. We start doing a little bit on educational research methods. So we look at the curriculum and assessment and we think about recreating learning resources. So you can see these are very much applied. There are no exams. We do um, continue. Well, we do um, assignment based learning, but most of it is not really essays. You do do the odd essay or report, but most a lot of it is very much about, say, designer materials or designer curriculum or, you know, plan a lesson so you know it's very much about practical skills these are just some of the optional modules that you can take on, across the the foundation degree um, we have specific ones that relate to send like dyslexia um, we've got a creative writing pathway that includes things like using stories we've got things that are relating to counseling skills coaching and mentoring um, and in going up to the BA year one we also have modules on autism and leadership those kind of things as options like I said, it's very much a practical program. So we're always relating theory to practice and vice versa. You do some research and some project work in your third year, and that relates to your day to day role in terms of designing and try and piloting uh, resources. Um, we help you to develop your digital skills and we also help you to make links between theory and practice um, and that you can take back to your um, classroom. So the kind of progression you can uh, take, as Sabai said earlier, you know, <coughs> and I put in the chat, what our students find is from the moment they start the degree, the career pathway is enhanced. Basically, the fact that they're on the degree shows to employers or potential employers that they're serious about the role and that they want to progress. 
So often, you know, somebody will start off, they've got a TA job, then they'll move to an HLTA, or they might become a specialist lead for something like autism um, or, or some area of SEN. They might become a, co a cover supervisor, go into leadership positions. Um, many of our students obviously want to go on to do PGCEs um, to deliver learning. And often they can do that through an assessment only route which only takes them a couple of months that they can do it through their, their current school. So, you know, it, it does really enable um, students to quickly move into teaching if they wish to do so. But we have a number of students that go into onto MAs and we're hoping for PhDs and we probably have already got some uh, in the pipeline. OK, so this is the teaching team. This is myself, Anita Collins, Nadine, you've been, you've been chatting to again today. She's going to come online in a minute. We have another mem a member of staff called Sally and Shaman, who I don't have a picture for at the moment. Um, there are also other part time tutors who are working across the centre, the Lifelong Learning Centre, who de uh, deliver on the different modules. So I'll let, just let Nadine come in now to just tell you a couple of things about our pastoral role. <clears throat> Hi. <laughs> um, by the way, my voice is always like this. It's quite... Um, do people always think I've got a cold? <laughs> um, so I just want to say, first of all, if there was anything of the content that we went over today that was a bit of a trigger for you, um, we're very aware that in our teaching, that kind of like our personal lives come into the sessions and, and similarly, the session content can sort of go into our personal lives. But we do have so many support mechanisms. So it's just to say, if you felt like anything kind of, um, so sort of played on your mind a little bit, just contact the team and we can signpost you to various support that we have. Um, and also just to say a lot of our students, if not practically all of them, typically start their journey with quite high levels of self-doubt. Um, and I just want to sort of highlight that a lot of the staff um, in our centre um, you know, identify themselves as coming from a working class background, or they're also, I'm the first in the family to go to university. Um, and we've, you know, most of us have actually been sort of mature part time um, students and we've had our own self doubt. So we're very open and transparent about how we've kind of challenged our own sort of um, own barriers, you know, and, and so that's a big thank you very much. Um, and in terms of the sort of challenges that can can kind of happen in terms of being a student, you know, we have lots of um, tutor, tutor sessions or pastoral support where we kind of talk about how you're getting on. So it's not just the formal teaching. It's kind of like, how's it going? What's working really well? Is there any sort of support that you need? Um, so all throughout your journey, throughout, you know, the whole of the FD and for those of you who've gone to the BA, um, you have your own dedicated um, tutor to sort of check in with you. Um, thank you Sarah, for adding that as well. So, so yeah, great. And I think you did brilliantly today. I'm so impressed with everybody, like getting so actively involved. It's just great to see. So well done. I know it's quite daunting in itself. So thank you. Thank you, Nadine. And yes, and can I also add my thanks? You've done brilliantly. And it's always a bit of a squash as well. We don't have a lot of time in these sessions, so you've done brilliantly. Um, so thank you for coming. We've got a little bit there in terms of student voices. It's just a link to a lovely video of one of our current uh, BA students um, and her practice as an autism lead practitioner. It's just one of our promotional videos. That's a really nice one there. So um, really just any, any questions, please put them in the chat. But we've got a couple of things to go on to, so don't go quiet yet. <laughs> um, so any questions that you have or anything you want to know, um, please just pop it in the chat um, and we will get to it now or after the session if we need to. Um, and I'll pass on to uh, Olivia just to finish off. Thanks, Anita. Yeah, please do put any questions in the chat or raise your hand if you want to speak to us. We may run a few minutes over. I hope that's OK with everyone. Just to say that because the Lifelong Learning Centre is the home and the hub for mature students at the University of Leeds, we're not just about offering courses. We're also offering about we're also about offering advice and support to people to think through their long term education and career options. So um, one of the main things that we, we want to offer people is an opportunity to have a one-to-one -one advice and guidance appointment. Obviously these are happening over the phone at the moment. It would be with either Denise or Mohammed, you can see on this slide, who are very experienced and qualified adult guidance advisors. They can talk through with you what your experience uh, might help you to go on to, whether part-time or full-time study would suit you best, which university or college might be best for you, which course. So that's what we mean by empowering 
impartial. They're not just talking about this one course or just about um, Leeds University degrees. So we'd really like um, you to get in touch and have a a one-to-one -to, -one to look at all your options finding out what's what's going to be best for you um, please do ask us questions if you if there's anything you'd like to know so um, thanks very much Nadine and Anita for posting your email there um, please do get in touch with them directly after the session and um, yes we have a poll up on the screen now it'd be lovely to take a quick snapshot of how you found today's session um, thanks very much for that. I'm going to stop the recording now.